Thanks so much. That's our uh, visitors. That is one of our bands it's called One Body. So let's thank them again. Hey, it's great to have everybody here this morning. My name is Bob Woodett, and I'm the chaplain here at Gordon. And uh, we're delighted to have our visitors uh, with us. How many of you are from outside New England? Outside of New England. All right. All right, the rest of you, how many of you are from outside New England? All right, so there's lots of folks. Hey, for, so the majority of you are from New England, right? And I mean, I grew up in New, I was born in New York, grew up in New Jersey, have lived in Maryland, now I live in New Hampshire. And, uh, but you know, New England today, right? This is, we're waiting for the leaves to change, but we also are really excited that the Red Sox are still playing, right? Walked one off last night. Big win, big win, right? It's one of those games that goes into extra innings and you, just, you have to sort of weigh like, what's the exhaustion worth tomorrow? What's the exhaustion worth? But you know, it was worth it. Whenever that happened, I was on my feet. You know, Patriots discover what it is to win. And I want you to all, Gordon students, through your mask, just put your head back and take a deep breath. Just smell through your nose, like take a whiff, take a whiff. You know what you're smelling? I smell quad break. Quad break is almost here. All right, quad break, so a four day weekend. The rest of the world's having three days this weekend, but we're doing four next weekend, and it's gonna be great. So uh, anyway, it's so good to have you all here. And uh, we've been looking um, this uh, semester at Proverbs. And so this morning, I'd like for us to uh, look together at uh, Proverbs chapter three. So let me, uh, let me read this. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life for many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. And do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious, precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to, who, uh, to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. You bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, as we uh, look at your word this morning, I pray that you would um, uh, stir in our hearts as we spend uh, the next 25 minutes with you. Lord, I pray that as you promise in your word, where two or more are gathered, there you are. So. Lord, we welcome you here, and I pray that we would leave here changed because we have spent time with you. So, Lord, be with us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start off with a question. What do you trust? What do you trust? And who do you trust? What do you trust, and who do you trust? Now, there's probably lots of variables there. I mean, what do I trust? I mean, I'm flying tomorrow morning and I'm trusting that the mechanic's having a good night tonight. 
and the pilot gets enough sleep, because I'm going into 8F and I'm buckling up, and we're going to launch that thing into the air. Now, I, I'm trusting that. I've done it lots of times, and so I, I, I feel okay with it. You ever sat next to somebody who doesn't like to fly, or their first time? Right? Oh my gosh, they're nervous wrecks. They're nervous wrecks. I, I had a Gordon student. We were going somewhere, and there were two guys sitting in front of me. We were going to a, the National Youth Workers Convention. I remember now, and, and neither one of them had ever flown before. The guy at the window is like stuck to the window, like in anticipation. And we haven't left the gate. And he's like looking out, right? The other guy is sitting there going, <laughs> as the plane backs out, he's like, <laughs> and he's got squeeze balls, like stress balls. And he's like, I'm like, we haven't even, like, we're not going anywhere yet. Finally, he's in such a panic, I lean up behind him and I say, if you don't calm down, I'm going to reach around and I'm going to put my hand over your nose and mouth until you pass out so that we rest of us can just relax. You know, he's like, we're backing out and he's going like, close the windows, close the I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, right, so who do you trust? He had no trust. He had no trust, right? But we, we trust lots of things. You got in your cars today. Right, visitors, you got in your cars, they started up just fine, hopefully. Right, and you got here. You don't think about it. When your car stops working, what do you start doing? You start shopping. Right, you start shopping. So what do you trust and who do you trust? I need a couple of volunteers. Alex, thank you very much. Come on up. I need one of our visitors to be brave. Oh, come right up here. All right. And your name is? Kate. Kate, and where are you from? I'm from Maine. Maine, the way life should be. Yes. The way life should be. All right, I've got an envelope for each of you. Your job is to guard these. And I will take them back at the end to see how well you've guarded them. Okay. All right? No pressure. Kate, the whole admissions thing is right here. No, here we go. Okay. All right, so there you go. Go relax. Okay. Go relax. Okay. Kate immediately holds it up to light to see what's in it. Well done. This morning, I, I want to talk about trust and I want to talk about honor because that's what the proverb is, uh, is talking about here. How is trust built? How is trust built? How do you get so that you know that something or someone is trustworthy? Right? Someone lets you down and now the next time they say, hey, trust me. Right, we sort of do our mental inventory going like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't think that works out right now. Trust is built through communication, but trust also is built through action. Right? Solomon goes on and he talks about honor. To build honor. We all want to be honorable. Right? We all want to be counted on as something, as someone who who has the honor, like, how, how many of you have had a chat with your parents at some point about the family name? Honor the family name, right? I mean, it's just, it's what you do. How do you honor? We honor through communication and action. Solomon begins this, uh, this uh, passage by talking about how important whatever is coming is. Sometimes in the Old Testament and in the New, uh, but lots of times in the old, the first few verses of a chapter are sort of queuing up the importance. Like, hey, let me have your attention here because what is coming is really needs some focus. Right? Needs some focus. So Solomon starts off by saying, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and of man. It's almost like Solomon saying, hey, stand by for a little fatherly advice. Right? I'm a dad, I'm a grandfather. I, we give advice, that's what we do. All right, it's, it's sort of our job. Let me give you some advice. Like what you're planning to do there, I, I don't think is probably a good idea. I, I, I don't think you should maybe go there. Just advice. Just advice. 
right? Gordon students, what advice did you get when you were dropped off at college? Everybody just yell one out. What's a piece of advice you got from your parents when they dropped you off here? Don't be stupid. All right, there you go. That's a classic. Somebody else. Call home. Call home. How many of you heard, call home because I'm paying for your phone? Right? We get that. Visitors. What, are, what advice have your family or relatives or friends given you in the college search? What advice? Somebody yell something out. Study. Study. Study is always a good thing. Study is always a good thing. Right? So we, we get advice um, and, and we, we have the decision to make what are we going to do with it? Right? We get advice. What are we supposed to do with it? My dad was one of the great advising people ever. He, my dad gave advice. My sisters and I used to kid that if you're going on a trip, my, my, my folks lived in Whiting, New Jersey. And we used to kid that you'll now begin to get instructions from Whiting Command. My dad would be given all kinds of advice. You know, he would tell me, because, you know, I think you should, how are you going to drive? Like, whenever I was going somewhere, how are you going to get there? And my, my dad didn't have a smartphone, right? So I'd say, well, my GPS says, let's go this way. And his, his advice would be like, Bob, how did your phone know that? I think this is a better route, right? And so he, he never quite got the whole phone thing and GPS, and yet now that's how we get everywhere, right? So this advice, Solomon goes on to say, let love and faithfulness never leave you. There's some advice. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. In fact, he says, tie them around your neck and write them on your heart. In other words, don't leave home without them. Because they'll help shape who you are. And who you are will shape who you will become. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. He says, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and of man. In other words, you'll be living a godly life. You'll be living a life which pleases God, you'll be living a life that man will notice. Man will notice. Our culture today, you live a godly life, and trust me, your light's going to shine because it's pretty dark out there. It's pretty dark out there. Right? Your life will be good. Enjoy it. Live it out. Then he says, trust in the Lord. So this is sort of the preamble, right? And then he goes, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. This is sort of where the rubber hits the road. All right, we can talk a good trust game, but trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your understanding. This, this one verse sort of describes the wrestling match that goes on in our hearts every day. I trust in the Lord. But, you know, I, I sort of have my own understanding of how we should best proceed here. Right? It's easy for me to take the reins back and say, God, I, I got this. But Solomon goes on to say, in all your ways, submit to him. We don't like the word submission. And yet God, as the very author of life, says, follow me. Follow me. But when you submit to him, he will make your path straight. He will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and shun evil. Right? So when he says, trust the Lord with all your heart, all, all is a big order. Right? It's easy for us to say, God, I got this section of my life, and this is yours. This is yours. I'm going to give you my, let's see, what slice? I'm going to give you my Sunday mornings. You got that? I go to a midweek Bible study. You got that? My entertainment life, yeah, I'll consider that maybe at another time. Or how I use my 
technology. I'll, 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 God, it's on the consideration list. Be patient with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, lean on him. And he will make your path straight. You know, God's not asking for the leftovers of our life. He's asking for what we've got. Because what we've got came from him in the first place. So like, what have you done with what I've given you? Solomon then goes on to say, honor the Lord with your wealth and your first fruits of all your crops. Now God is getting in your kitchen. Right? I can do lots of things, God, but don't tell me what to do with my money. I pray you give me more. You give me more, I'll be more generous. Students, I want to tell you a truth. All of you, if I ask, how many, I'll just ask, how many of you ha basically don't have any money? I, I, I want to share this challenge with you. When, you. when you don't have much money, it is never a better time in your life to learn what it means to tithe than when you don't have much money. Because if you're waiting till you have money, you will chase that thing around in a circle for the rest of your lives. It is a discipline. So God gets in our kitchen and he says, honor me with your wealth, with the first fruits, give me the best. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim with new wine. God said, trust this to me and I got you. I got you. Sometimes we don't get what we want, right? He says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord's discipline, he disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. All right, I mean, we have to remember sometimes, you know, I think it's really easy for us sometimes in the evangelical church to sort of make God our buddy. Right, and he's there to give us what we want. You know, if God gives us everything we want, then we don't work for him, he works for us. Right, God, God's challenge is trust in me, honor me, and I will take good care of you. I will take good care of you. You know, bring your best. You know, and when I think about that, what does it mean what do we have to do to trust? To trust the action that is required of us in order to trust is to entrust. Right? I can say, I trust you, but it's only words until I entrust something to you. Here is something that's mine. And I, I, I want to give it to you. I want to give it to you. You know, um, who do we entrust things to? I, I've got seven grandchildren. They're all cute. They're all per nearly perfect. Sloane is our youngest granddaughter, and Sloane is six months old. Six months old. I asked my, my daughter, Amanda, like, you and Matt left her with anybody yet? They just moved to a new city. Family just moved to Baltimore. They don't know anybody yet. Right? So their neighbors all look like they're trustworthy people. But it's different between looking trustworthy and someone giving you their child and saying, please, I entrust their care to you. How many of you have been a babysitter at some point? You have no idea. I, I want to give you some perspective. That is one of the greatest honors a parent can give to another individual is to entrust their child to them. That is a great job. Do it well. You know, we, it's the entrustment. It's the importance of relationship, right? We don't walk up to somebody we don't know and say, hey, here's the keys to my car. 
keep an eye on it. Or just take it for a ride. Take it for a ride, right? You lose trust. There's one of these parking places in Boston, like on the way to Logan Airport. I used to bring my car. And my colleague, Mark Canister, used to leave his car there. And uh, Mark gets his car back once and he says, you know, is a place where you left your keys with them and they'll park it for you? And Mark says, you know, I, I had 118 miles put on my car while I was gone. What? So I, I was parked there as well. But I, I had gone, this is the old trick, right? You go into the little trip thing and you go to B and you zero it out and I parked it there. I got mine back, had 134 miles on it. I called the owner of the place. I'm like, what is going on there? This is his response. Hey, I've got some new employees and I don't really know them yet. <laughs> really? He goes, and this is what he asked, this was his ask of me. He goes, could you go onto your Easy Pass and see if they were driving in and out of the city through the tunnel? I was like, no, I'm not doing that and I'm never stopping at your place again. I feel like warning the people when I'm standing at Terminal B waiting for the shuttle buses, like, check your mileage. Don't trust them. They lost my trust, they lost my business. I'll never entrust my vehicle to them again. How do you decide who you trust and what you trust with? You know, throughout scripture, God has shown up for those who trusted him. He has always shown up. When they don't trust him, the result is carry us. When we don't trust him, the result is us carrying burdens that we don't need to because we think we got this when we know it has us. You know, think of some of the challenges that people came up against with, the, you know, struggles in their lives, struggles for their lives. You know, chased by the Egyptians, the Israelites show up at the banks of the Red Sea and God says, I want you over there. Oh, and the Egyptians are coming and they're not happy. Problem. Big problem, bigger God. Big problem, bigger God. Gideon in the battle of the Midianites, the feeding of the 5,000, or just the trust of the woman who said, if I can reach out and touch the edge of his robe, I will be healed. Trust that needed no words, but needed the action of reaching out. In scripture, we're constantly encouraged to turn to him. Turn to him. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Ephesians 6, 8, and pray in the Lord in all occasions, in all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people question this morning is, what's the biggest challenge that you face in entrusting more of who you are to the Savior? What are you still hanging on to? Is it being willing to entrust things to him? Our natural tendency is always to do it for ourselves. God, I know you're busy. I, this is a little thing. I got this. You got the big things. Please, you know, I, who decides that? God says, Bring your concerns to me. Because our tendency is to think God's got bigger things to do. He does not. The biggest thing he has to do is love on you today. To love on you, love on all of us. We trust God, but do we entrust him? That is the question. We talk a good trust game, but do we entrust, which is turning something over and saying, God, here, please take this. Please take this. Kate, now, should you bring the envelope back up, please? It's like a game show. Please bring the envelope back up. Thank you. You can wait right here. All right, they have carefully guarded the envelopes. They're still sealed. All right, Kate did a really good job guarding this envelope. In this envelope, 
was 25 cents. Thank you, Kate, for guarding this with your life. Stay right here. Alex, Alex, go to this envelope. Had everything in my wallet in it. $69. $69. Kate just, Kate just asked a great question. How did he get that envelope? You know how he got that envelope? Because I know him. I know him. I know him and I trusted him. I didn't know you, although I should trust you. Yeah, maybe you should. I should. But isn't that exactly what we do with God? Right? Sometimes what we give to him has everything to do with how much we trust him. And how much we trust him has everything to do with how well we know him. Right? How well we know him is what makes that difference. Thank you very much. All right, we get. What are you trusting to him today? What are you entrusting him? See, the reality is we trust him sometimes with our nickels, dimes, and quarters. God wants your debit card and pin. Right? He wants it. He, wa he, wants, he wants what's really dear to us. He wants us to entrust him. We're going to end now. The band's going to come back up in just a moment. And um, as we do this, this is my question. How do we put down the burdens we carry? How do we put them down? How can we support one another as members of the body of Christ in the burdens that we carry? On that, you all got a post-it note on the way in. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Is there a burden, and that burden could be a person, that burden could be a thing, that burden might be the midterm that you haven't read the books for yet. I mean, that burden could be whatever. But if you have a burden today that you want to turn over, I want you to write it on that post-it note. And then as you leave this morning, whether you're going out the back doors or these doors, I'm going to ask you to stick the post-it note on the wall. Those of you who are prayer warriors or those of you who want to step up your prayer game and pray for, pray for real needs, they're going to stay up all week. You don't put your names on them, but feel free to come by and pray for the needs here. That we might trust the Lord our God with all our heart and all our strength. God bless.